Ready to go. Can um can you see my screen? I think we can. Bird families. Can everybody see Kurt's screen? Is it somebody? Yes, <laughs> I can see it. All right. I see it. All right. Yes. Just checking. Um, so I guess we're ready to get started. Um, welcome everybody to Birds of the East Mojave. I'm Kurt Leuschner. And um, I've got a couple of PowerPoints I'm going to go through with you in just a minute. And we can talk about the weekend a little bit too to get things started. And, and certainly you can ask questions um, in the beginning or at the end. I'll put things in the chat, but we'll get all your questions answered. So uh, let's talk about logistics a little bit for the weekend. Some of you haven't been to Zizek's before, Desert Study Center. Um, there's nothing on the agenda for Friday in terms of class or anything. So the main goal on Friday is just to get yourself there safely. And, um, you know, try to arrive before too late. I'm gonna aim to get there by five myself. And also know that there can be a lot of traffic on the 15 on a Friday heading to Vegas. So plan accordingly. And um, once you get there, the gate will either be open or there's, there's a chance it'll be closed. And if it's closed, you just um, get out of your car and open it. It's not locked. And then drive through and then close it behind you. So the rule with the gate is to just leave it like you found it. If it's already open, leave it open. If it's closed, close it behind you. And once you drive in and park, you'll meet Jason, the um, manager of the Desert Study Center who also teaches the reptiles class. And he will um, check you in and show you where your room is and all that kind of stuff. He does these little orientation tours for everybody who comes. He doesn't like to do a whole bunch of them though. So he usually likes to get a group of people and do one orientation, say at five or 5.30 and then another maybe at six or 6.30. Um, so we'll kind of play it by ear. Our group's not very big. There'll be about 10 of us all together. And I think we're the only ones there. So we're, we're, we're gonna have the place to ourselves. Um, so anyway, nothing on the agenda Friday night except arrive and, and relax. Um, bring your own food for Friday night or eat along the way. Uh, there's no food included on Friday. Uh, however, meals are included uh, starting Saturday morning with breakfast. We'll actually be um, having breakfast over at the Magritte Cafe in Baker and then picking up lunches to go. And then uh, we'll pick up dinner at the Mad Greek, um, which we'll bring back to the Desert Study Center to eat later on on Saturday. And then uh, Sunday breakfast is also included over at the Mad Greek, um, where we'll end up. Uh, when class ends around lunchtime at the Baker Sewage Pond, most likely. Um, so we'll, we'll, uh, our schedule will be a little bit uh, flexible this weekend uh, because of the catering situation and having to go to the Mad Greek. So I'm not sure what you were sent exactly in terms of the schedule, but we'll go over all that on Friday and, and, um, and figure out a plan of action Saturday is our field trip day, so we will be driving uh, over to Death Valley, or at least to the corner of Death Valley, a place called Shoshone in China Ranch. Um, so Saturday will be our, our, our driving day where we're going to hit a bunch of different birding hotspots, um, see what we can find. Sunday we'll be birding uh, closer to the Desert Study Center, so we'll stick close. Anyway. Um, Feel free to ask more questions later about that, or on, I'll just see you Friday evening and we'll have plenty of time to talk about details. Um, pay attention to the um, information that was sent to you about like what to bring to the Desert Study Center. Um, they provide beds, but not bedding. So you wanna bring pillows and a towel and a sleeping bag or some sheets or something. I was just looking at the weather uh, report for Baker this coming weekend. 
It looks like Friday will be the warmest day with a high of about 99. Uh, then the temperature drops slightly on Saturday, a little less warm, but still in the 90s when it peaks. And then Sunday is only going to be in the 80s. So it looks like there's going to be a temperature drop Saturday night, which probably means Saturday night's going to be windy too. <clears throat> but anyway, the weather looks to be uh, pretty good. Um, no big heat waves or anything coming in. Um, all right, well, let's get to the birds. Um, I, I was going to show you one PowerPoint, and then I decided, well, I'm going to show you two. So um, I apologize if I go a little quick on the first one, but, it, but it's kind of like a bonus PowerPoint that I wasn't even going to show you tonight, but I thought it would be best to start with a quick review of some of the common bird families, and then we can talk more specifically about uh, the different species that we might encounter at the Desert Studies Center uh, during a spring weekend, during migration. And this weekend, we'll talk more about migration and the status and distribution of these birds and their natural history and all the stuff you want to know about them. There'll be plenty of time for that. But let's talk about these families of birds. Here's a little rundown of how birds are classified from kingdom on down to species. Um, birds are in a class all their own, and there's about 10,000 or more species. The number keeps growing in the world. Um, and these 10,000, 11,000 species that are in the world are broken up into about 30, um, 30 or to 35 different orders, depending on how you look at it broad groupings of birds. And then these orders are broken up further into about 220 or so families of birds. For instance, the blue-footed booby, uh, which we don't expect to see this weekend, but you never know, um, is in the family Sulidae. And then every species, of course, has its own uh, scientific name, which includes the genus and the species name. So when you're first starting out learning the birds, it's good to focus on the family. That's why it's in red here, to remind you that if you can learn the basic families of birds, uh, you're, you'll be on your way to learning what different species they are later on. Let's start with the families. And that's what I wanna show you here. I wanna show you some of the, the families of birds that we'll encounter this weekend. One of those families is the New World Vultures, Cathartidae. And um, this includes the vultures and the condor, these large soaring birds with uh, no feathers on their head and a diet of carrion, dead stuff. So they're in a different family, say, than from hawks or eagles. Another family we're going to encounter this weekend includes the hawks and eagles. Um, these are three species that are common in a lot of areas of, in Southern California, not just where we're going to be, red-tailed hawk, red-shouldered hawk, and cooper's hawk going from left to right. Exipitridae, the hawks and eagles. Um, they've got sharp talons for catching their prey. Um, they've got sharp beaks for tearing into the flesh. Um, they're great flyers and make huge nests. Another family we may encounter includes the swifts, Apodidae. They're kind of like swallows, but they're in a different family from swallows. They have more of a fluttering flight. The one we uh, hope to see on the left there is the white-throated swift. These guys have such tiny feet that they can't even perch with them. So they just spend all day on the wing, Apodidae. Another family we'll encounter is Trochilidae, the hummingbirds. Uh, Costa's hummingbird on the right is the one associated with the desert region. In migration, we see the rufous, this orangey one, and the annas is present in many different habitats in the upper left. But uh, the hummingbirds in general, though, are small birds, the only birds that can fly backwards. They beat their wings 80 times a second. Um, they're just amazing, unique little birds, Trochilidae. Another family we'll be looking for are the woodpeckers, Piccadee. 
And here you can see two uh, species that frequent our desert areas, uh, the ladder-backed woodpecker on the left and the nut owls on the right, which favors wetter areas. Uh, woodpeckers have chisel-like bills. They've got feet that are arranged with two toes in the front, and two toes in the back. They've got stiff tails, as you can see, to prop themselves up. These are all characteristics of that family. Another big family we're going to see many members of this weekend are the tyrant flycatchers, Tyrannidae. Birds like the western kingbird on the left and the black phoebe on the right. They tend to perch out in the open. They've got small bristles around the base of their bills to help them detect their prey, called rictal bristles. They've got somewhat peaked heads um, and these sallying behaviors, often returning to the same perch after they catch an insect. Flycatchers. This uh, bird family has only one species in it in our area, the loggerhead shrike. So shrikes are in the family Linneidae. And um, they're known for impaling their prey, like this shrike has done uh, with a lizard here. We'll talk about why they do that this weekend. Hopefully we can find a shrike or two along Isaac's Road. Watch for them as you're driving in. They like to sit on the tops of bushes. Um, they do have a, a hooked beak. They are considered to be a small bird of prey. A drab gray family of small birds are the vireos, virionidae. Um, and so these little vireos will find in the bushes and the trees, and they have a very slow, sluggish kind of a movement, unlike the warblers, which are more frantic in their behaviors. And most vireos, as I mentioned, are kind of a drab gray color, such as the uh, warbling vireo on the left and the Bell's vireo on the right. So we're going to hear and see a vireo or two this weekend. Another family we'll be watching for, and there's six species that could pass through this weekend, are the swallows, Hirundinidae. Here you see cliff swallow on the left and barn swallow on the right, two of the more common swallows that make mud nests. Swallows are kind of like swifts, but they're in a different family. Their wings um, have more of a classic shape, not that boomerang shape. Their flight is more traditional too. It's not that fluttering bat-like flight that a swift has but they do eat insects and spend most of the day flying around. But unlike swifts, uh, these birds can actually perch when they wanna take a break. Little family of brownish birds includes the wrens, Trogodytidae. And these are three species that we could encounter this weekend, including the Buick's wren on the left, the rock wren in the upper right, which we sometimes see along Zizek's road as you're driving in, and the cactus wren uh, we'll see in more dense vegetation like around Shoshone. Wrens have uh, thin beaks with a slight curve to them. They're like tweezers and they probe crevices looking for spiders and insects to eat. They've got uh, short stubby tails that sometimes stick up and most of them are some shade of brown. And they live in holes or crevices, most of them do. The cactus wren makes its own nest though. A little uh, family of birds called the kinglets, which means little king, Regulidae. Uh, the ruby crowned kinglet on the right is a winter resident of the desert, but sometimes we see one even in the first week of May who hasn't migrated away yet, but most of them should be gone by now, heading north to, to the mountains to nest. And every now and then we encounter a golden crowned kinglet that comes down from the mountains into one of these desert oases. Kinglets are small, grayish birds, a couple of wing bars. They have a habit of flicking their wings. They've got stubby little bills, insect eaters. The silky flycatchers are a tropical family with one representative, and that's the phenopepla that you see here, the male on the right, the female on the left. Tilogonatidae is the family. So their closest relatives are down in the tropics. There's a lot of interesting things about this bird species. I'll save that for this weekend and tell you more about them once we see one. Pretty neat bird though. 
The warblers, uh, spring is always an exciting time to try to find as many different of these warblers as we can. Perulidae is the family. Most warblers tend to be small, very active birds with some amount of yellow on them, some more than others. Here we can see the Wilson's warbler down below, the common yellow throat on the upper right, and the yellow rumped warbler on the left. We may see these and uh, a few other species as well. They eat insects and they're heading north at this time. The Cardinality family includes uh, birds like the bunting on the left, the lazuli bunting, and the black-headed grosbeak on the right. Uh, these birds tend to have very strong, big conical bills for cracking larger seeds. So they're seed eaters. And both of these uh, birds can be found in any of the blooming mesquites um, at Zizix. We'll be watching for them as they migrate north. Imagine that most of these birds are migrating at night and in the early morning, they're looking for a nice place to spend the day, like the Desert Study Center, where they see greenery and there's water and there's insects and there's places to rest and to hide. So they're looking for these little green islands in the middle of the desert, these little oases to land in. And those are the places that we're gonna go this weekend, to try to find these tired migrant birds. Icteridae includes the back, blackbirds and the orioles. Great teal grackle on the left and the hooded oriole on the right, for examples. They're fairly large birds, black in color or sometimes brightly colored like the orioles with pretty strong, uh, formidable bills, a little bit of a curve. Tyridae. And the finches are in the family fringility. These are small birds, usually colored yellow or reddish. Uh, and they've got very pointy bills for eating small seeds like thistle seeds. And here we have the lesser goldfinch on the left, our most common little finch besides the house finch and the less common Lawrence's goldfinch on the right. Agility. Anyway, so that was just a quick rundown of, of the um, bird families, just to remind you of the broader groupings of birds. And now let me get to the main show. Give me one sec here. Oops, I'm not this one, yes. So now I'm gonna go through um, actual, and, and you're gonna see some of the same species now, but actual species that we um, have encountered and could encounter uh, this weekend at Zizix. Spring birds. I also do a class in the fall in October. So if you uh, have a good time this weekend and wanna come back in October, watch for that class. And you'll get to sample uh, the Desert Study Center in Zizix at a different time of the year. It's usually a little cooler in the fall. The weather can be a lot different in the fall and the birds can be a lot different too. So it's neat to see it at two different times of the year. But right now we're talking spring and we're talking about birds in their finest plumage, usually. Um, so some of these spots we're gonna visit have water, including the Desert Study Center. There's a couple of ponds there. And so anytime you have water in the middle of the desert, anything can happen and any bird can show up, uh, including Canada geese. So we'll be watching for geese and ducks on these various water spots including the Baker Sewage Pond. Uh, cinnamon teal uh, is another bird that we probably will encounter at one or two places this weekend. Now this chucker par partridge is imported from Asia. So they're introduced for hunting, uh, but they've taken up resident in some desert regions, uh, including Death Valley, and also more recently um, in the area around the Desert Study Center. Kurt, so, we yes. haven't seen the change in the slides. You're not seeing still seeing the first one. Okay, hold on. All right, hang on. 
because I'm seeing the new slides. I guess you're seeing the old ones. Yep. Okay. Hang on. Um, let me stop this one. I probably need to close the first one. Let's see. Let me share again. Thanks for telling me. Um, share, share screen. Okay, how about now? That's spring bird. Yep. Okay, good, thank you. I was seeing it, <laughs> but you weren't. Um, so anyway, you know what a Canada goose looks like. You heard me talking about it. And maybe you heard me mention the cinnamon teal, one of my favorites. The females are tricky, but here you see a couple of males. And then I was just uh, speaking about the chucker. So chucker's a more recent arrival to the area. Um, it would be a real bonus to see one, but you never know. And Zizek's Road, as you're driving in, is one of those places to really watch for stuff, uh, including bighorn sheep. We have a good chance of seeing some of the bighorn that frequent Zizek's Road. There's a couple of water, um, water spots along the road that attracts the wildlife. Um, loons. Now, I, th I threw in this loon with young on the back just for fun, but the loons do not nest at Zizek's. Don't get too excited. But they do migrate through the area. Now, most of them migrate along the coast. But some of them um, get off course, or maybe they're coming from the Salton Sea, but they end up flying over the middle of the desert. And so they're looking for a place to land that has water. And um, a couple of times over the years, I've been doing this class for about 20 years, um, we've had uh, common loons pitch in to the pond at Zizek's and even yodel for us. So you never know what to watch for. Um, one of the resident birds on some of these water ponds is this bird, the pie-billed grebe, that eats fish. Now, there's an endangered fish in the ponds at Zizek's called the Mojave Tui Chub. It's a small little perch-like fish. <clears throat> it's highly endangered. But don't tell that to the pie-billed grebes. <laughs> they do eat those fish, and so do the kingfishers. You can't read the signs that are there. On the edges of some of these wet spots that we'll visit, we hope to find uh, egrets and herons, including the snowy egret that you see here. They're also migrating through the desert. And also we'll be looking for white-faced ibis, which are passing through at this time. Sometimes there's flocks of them or just a single bird or two. Uh, when we go to, to Copa on Saturday, it's near China Ranch, there's a marsh there called Grimshaw Lake. And uh, that's the kind of place where we look for white-faced ibis. They're in a family called uh, Fresci ornithidae, the ibises in the spoonbill because of that really unique beak that they have. We'll be uh, checking the skies. There's a lot of wide open skies at Zizek's. So we, we can't forget to look up and look for hawks and eagles and vultures and swallows and everything else. And one of the birds um, we could encounter is the Swainson's hawk. Now it's getting a little bit late for them. Most of them pass through in April and even March. Um, but sometimes we get a lingering Swainson's hawk in early May. And some of these birds originated down in Argentina where they spend the winter and they're heading north, either to Northern California or somewhere between here and the Canadian border. Now falcons are not in the same family as hawks and eagles. They're in their own family, Falconidae partly to do with the way they fly and the shape of their wings. They're the fastest flying birds on earth. It's the peregrine falcon here. 
And uh, we might see a peregrine migrating through, or more likely we might see the prairie falcon, which is a resident of the Desert Studies Center area. Falconidae is the family. In the marshy areas, uh, we'll be watching for rails like this little Sora. And these rails do migrate. They fly at night and they hang out in the day uh, in these wet spots in the desert. So you never know. Uh, wherever there's water and marshy areas and mudflats, you might find the killdeer, this bird in the upper left, with the two bands on its chest. Uh, they don't tend to nest where we're going to be, but they're passing through. And same thing with this semi-palmated plover in the lower right here. He has only one band on his chest and a stubbier bill with a little bit of orange in it. But uh, any of these birds, again, can be seen in places like the Baker Sewage Pond or anywhere where there's mud flats. So we're hoping there's going to be some water in some of these places, although it's been a very dry year. Black necks still uh, frequent the edges of these ponds and muddy areas and marshes. And they're also in a family uh, of their own with um, the avocets, the curvirostridae. And it has to do with their really uh, thin beaks and those spindly legs that avocets and stilts tend to have is the black neck stilt. Black terns, uh, spring, sometimes we encounter black terns at the Baker Sewage Pond or even at Zizek's. They're one of the smaller terns, darker in color. They have a very buoyant flight. They're in the same family along with gulls. Gulls and terns. There's a new dove in town and these Eurasian collar doves are everywhere now and they've been taken over. I'm sure you have them in your own neighborhoods. And they've now um, invaded Zizek's and Baker. And we'll see more than we need to this weekend. They're large doves, very pale, the black collar on the back of their neck, a ring, uh, not, not a total ring, but a collar. And um, doves uh, and pigeons are in the same family, Columbidae. Owls. Um, there are some tamarisk trees in the public parking area, just as you approach the Desert Studies Center. And sometimes in the spring, we see long-eared owls in those trees, sometimes more than one. Uh, it's one of the owls species that actually does move around and migrate, but not every year. It's kind of an irregular movement too. So some years you see a lot of them, other years, you don't see any. So we'll see what 2022 holds for us. Uh, one year though, in the parking lot area there in those tamarisk trees, we counted close to 60 of these owls that we flushed. It was amazing. I'd be happy to see one though this weekend. They kind of look like great horned owls, but they're slimmer and trimmer, a little more vertical and less, uh, wide body than a great horned owl and even their feather tufts on their head are a little more vertical than a typical great horned owl and they have a little more tawny color in their facial disc compared to a great horned owl so when you first see them you think great horned owl and then you take a second look and you say there's something different about this great horned owl and you look closely and it's a long-eared owl so in many places in the desert they're actually more common than the great horned owls there's a great horned owl here on the right. So we'll be listening for owls at night. Uh, we might hear the great horned owl and we might see the long-eared owl during the day if we flush one from a tree somewhere. If you happen to drive through the Mojave National Preserve on Friday on your way to the Desert Study Center, uh, be sure to stop at Kelso, Kelso Depot where the visitor center is and also check the trees around Kelso for things like long-eared owls. I'll be doing that on on Friday, did I say Saturday? Um, I'll be doing that on Friday on my way up to the Desert Studies Center. So maybe I'll see you there around uh, 3.30 or something like that. 
Um, lesser nighthawks have arrived in the desert for the summer. And it's something that we might see or hear at dusk at the Desert Study Center. Lesser nighthawk. Another bird that likes to fly at dusk and also in the early morning um, in those crepuscular times is the Vox's swift. So earlier I showed you the white-throated swift, which is the resident one. These Vox's swifts are migrants and they're moving through the desert right now as we speak. And about this time of night, it's 7.30 right now, is uh, one of the best times to look out your window and see if you see any bat-like birds flying by. They've got this fluttering flight. They look a lot like a bat, they're not much bigger than a bat. And uh, if you're familiar with chimney swifts, they're almost identical. Box of swifts, also in the family of Podidae. We talked about hummingbirds earlier and the Costas hummingbird is the one we will see somewhere, probably at China Ranch if, if, if uh, we haven't seen one by then. And we also might see the Anna's hummingbird. But surprisingly, uh, we don't see many hummingbirds on a weekend at Zizek's. And that's just because there aren't many flowering shrubs where we're gonna be. Um, so you, I don't know if you're going out there expecting to see a lot of hummingbirds, but we won't. But we'll see an Anna's or a Costas. And maybe, maybe if we're lucky, we'll see a Rufus somewhere flying through, migrating. Because of those fish, those endangered fish I mentioned in the ponds at Zizek's, the kingfishers do like to stop there as they migrate across the desert. It's one of the few birds where the female is actually more brightly colored than the male. It's the female on the right, male on the left. So they have kind of a role reversal. Phalaropes is another bird type that does this too. Belted kingfishers. So they're in their own family, the kingfishers, Elsidinbi. Woodpeckers, I mentioned, are in the family Picadee. And here you have the red-breasted sapsucker, which is a winter visitor to many of our desert areas and a spring migrant. So we might encounter one of these right around the rooms. If you do a little snooping around the trees and bushes on your own, um, you might just find a red-breasted sapsucker behind the bathrooms in one of the trees. Um, and they're on their way north to the Sierras. They're, they're moving around, but they're not going to stick around too long. Red-vested sapsucker. You can see these little sap wells that they leave in the um, bark of the tree. And then they come by and lick the sap that pools up in each one of these. Uh, I mentioned the flycatcher family, and, and this is the vermilion flycatcher. Uh, they're becoming more common in a, in a number of places in Southern California, and that's good news. They seem to be adapting to the human environment better than other species. And uh, we hope to see them this weekend, maybe at China Ranch or in Shoshone. Vermilion flycatcher. And if we're really lucky, uh, we might find uh, one of these lost scissor-tailed flycatchers. Uh, this is the state bird of Oklahoma, but he's a long way from Oklahoma if he shows up here. But um, one spring we did have one of these um, at a place called Saratoga Spring, which is in Death Valley. We're gonna be right on the border of Death Valley this weekend. But they do show up occasionally, you never know. And um, there'll be various vireos that we can um, look at this weekend. I mentioned the vireos tend to be small and grayish and have more of a stubby bill compared to warblers. Um, and uh, we'll be sorting these out this weekend. Bell's vireos and we'll also be listening for them at China Ranch. Cowbirds are in that blackbird and oriole family, Icteridae, and they're nest parasites. So the female will actually lay her egg in other birds' nests, like those vireos I just showed you. Um, and here's, look at this, this is a cowbird baby. And here are the 
probably vireo babies here. It's a much bigger mouth, bigger target. It gets all the food. And these other birds end up starving to death, sadly. We'll talk more about the cowbirds and what's being done to try to control their numbers this weekend. Ground-headed cowbird. Ravens, uh, we'll see plenty of these. It's another bird that um, is creating some problems in desert ecosystems, especially with desert tortoises. And we'll also talk more about ravens and what needs to be done in that regard. Ravens are in the uh, family Corvidae, the Corvids, which includes the jays and the magpies and some of the most intelligent birds in the world. Um, this is one of the swallow species that we could encounter this weekend. It's called the bank swallow. Notice it has a, a pretty distinct brownish band on the upper chest. If this were a northern rough wing swallow, which is much more common, um, you wouldn't see this dark, distinct band. You'd see more of a diffuse um, brownish color here. It wouldn't be so white below. It would be more of an even diffuse brown, light brown here, but not the band contrasting with the whiter belly. So these are small swallows. They're a little bit smaller than say a rough wing swallow. And again, immediately you notice a white belly contrasting with a darker band if you can get a good look at it flying overhead. They're one of the least common of the six swallows that we could see this weekend, um, but they do occur and, and we hope to be able to pick one or two of them out of the swallow flocks. Bank swallow. The um, canyon wren lives at Zizix in the rocky areas just behind your rooms. Again, if you take a little stroll on your own and walk up the road a little bit, um, you might just find a canyon wren on one of the rocks. And they've got a, a little more color and a little more contrast compared to a rock wren. Here you can see a, quite a bright white throat and some fairly rich orangey color. This picture doesn't really show it, but you'll see they're, they're quite colorful compared to a rock ring. And they've got this uh, beautiful descending call. I'll play it for you this weekend. In the spring, um, we, and in the winter, uh, we encounter the blue gray gnat catcher in the deserts. And uh, we may see one at Zizix, but we're more likely to see one at Shoshone. And they're on their way up to higher altitudes. They usually nest in the mid elevations where there's pinion and juniper. So we'll be listening for them and looking for them in Shoshone alongside the resident black tailed gnat catcher, which is much more common than the blue gray that you see here. So if we see a gnat catcher, we'll definitely talk about the differences between the two species and try to sort out the species and the males from the females. Another bird that's kind of moving up the slopes right now, and it's gonna nest in some high mountain meadow is the Townsend Solitaire. If they're in the bluebird family with the uh, Western bluebird, the same family, uh, but they're more of a grayish color. They're not blue. They kind of remind you of a mockingbird when you first see them. Um, but true to their name, you almost always see them by themselves. And they're very quiet. They almost never sing on migration, only when they get to the breeding grounds. So you'll encounter this bird that kind of looks like a big gray bluebird or a mockingbird. And then you'll see a lot of white in the tail when it takes off. That's something to watch for. And you'll see this thin white eye ring. So we'll be watching for this bird um, along Zizek's Road or anywhere we go this weekend. And, and we'll be lucky maybe to see one of them somewhere. Towns in solitaire. Um, this thrush is the Swainton's thrush and they're passing through right now. Uh, the hermit thrushes passed through a little bit earlier. Now we're seeing more Swainton's thrushes there. Spotting is confined more to the upper chest. 
Um, and also their coloration is more of an even brown all the way from head down to the tail. Whereas hermit thrushes tend to have a rusty orange tail that contrasts with the brown back. Like the solitaire, these birds are usually by themselves. These guys are usually on the ground, however, hopping around the leaf litter. We'll be watching for them, the, the Swainson's thrush. And the Northern Mockingbird, they're wherever you live and they're also at the places we're gonna be this weekend, very noisy. And uh, white wing patches when they fly. They're in the Thrasher family, which is called Mimidy. And, and of course the Northern Mockingbird is the king of all the mimics. Its whole song repertoire is comprised of sounds that it hears from other birds. Uh, this is the European starling. It's an import from Europe and Asia. Not a good bird to have around. Um, and starlings are in the family Sternity. And unfortunately, we'll see a few. Hopefully not at the Desert Studies Center, but probably in town uh, near Baker or Shoshone. They've got shorter tails than blackbirds do, and, and they are in a different family, and they have the yellow bill. Lucy's warbler. Now this is kind of a specialty of Zyzix. So in the spring, earlier in the spring, especially in April, but maybe we'll, I think we might be lucky this weekend. We might hear this bird singing and, and hopefully we'll get to see one really quickly. They're one of the few warblers that doesn't have any yellow at all in them. They're just all gray. And they kind of look like a verdant. Uh, but you see, they don't have any yellowish in the face like a Vernon does. And then they got this little orangey red cap and right here above the tail as well. Uh, Lucy's warbler. So we'll probably hear them before we see them. I'm not sure if they nest at the Desert Study Center, but they might be trying to. They do nest though um, in the China Ranch area. But they're not very common and we need a little bit of luck to find them this weekend. Lucy's warbler. It's a warbler that you can commonly see in Southeast Arizona if you travel south of Tucson. They love mesquites. The Townsend's warbler. Um, here you've got a female on the left without the black throat, a male on the right with the black throat. Uh, they're passing through right now. They're gonna nest in the mountains. They're gonna nest in um, a fir forest somewhere maybe a coastal forest, but here in the desert, they're just passing through right now. So we'll be watching for them. Townsend's Warbler. This is an oven bird. Now this is more of an Eastern Warbler, but uh, they do occur with some regularity um, at places like the Desert Study Center in spring. So watch for this bird on the ground, uh, kind of acting like a thrush, but they're actually a type of warbler, believe it or not. The oven bird. Sometimes we've seen them right outside the office. This is a bird that used to be a warbler. Then they moved it into its own group. It's called the yellow-breasted chat. It looks more like a small little thrasher. But it's not a thrasher either. It's just something in between. It's got a little bit of everything in it. Um, but it's a neat bird. It's a very loud bird. We'll hear them before we see them. And China Ranch is probably our best bet at finding one of these birds, yellow-breasted chat. They nest in uh, some of these oases. We'll be checking out sparrows uh, this weekend, like the Savannah Sparrow. They like wet grassy areas and we're gonna see some of that habitat. They've got some very fine streaking. Uh, it's not as, uh, thick of a streaking and extensive as say a song sparrow. They've got a little bit of a spot on their chest, but again, it's not as prominent as a song sparrow. And then in most plumages, they've got a little bit of yellowish wash in the face, but not always. So, you know, uh, it's a combination of factors. Anyway, this is the Savannah sparrow. They're one of the more common migrant sparrows that we should encounter in a wet grassy area. The black-headed grosbeaks are moving through right now. They're in the cardinality family with that thick bill. 
It's the male on the right and the female on the left. Black-headed crossbeak. I'm not doing any of the sounds tonight, but we can um, hear what a lot of these birds sound like this weekend. I can uh, imitate a few of them. And of course we can play their songs on our phone apps as well. But this yellow-headed blackbird has some amazing sounds. Uh, we don't usually hear it though in migration, uh, but we may encounter one or two or if we're lucky a small flock of these birds uh, somewhere along the way especially on Saturday, yellow-headed blackbird. The male here is pretty unmistakable. He's even got a white wing patch. Uh, but when you see this yellow head and chest, you know right away it's a yellow-headed blackbird. The hooded orioles like palm trees. There are some palms at Zizek's. I'm not sure that they nest there, but they might try. Uh, but we'll probably see a hooded oriole or two, um, if not at Zizek's, then out at China Ranch area. This is the male on the right, and the female is here. Um, she doesn't have the black throat, and she's not quite as brightly colored. Hooded oriole. And the finch uh, family, fringility, this is that common uh, lesser goldfinch that we'll probably see a number of. The males have a black cap and are more brightly colored than the females. There's a female up here. Lesser goldfinch. They also have a green back. The ones back east have a black back. Someday they may split the two. Lesser goldfinch. And to round out the finches, we've got the ever-present house finch, which is everywhere. Male on the left, female on the right. And I think that's the end of the slideshow. So um, I'm going to stop sharing. And I'd like to open it up to some questions and hope that you might have a few questions for me, either about the birds or maybe about the Desert Study Center or what to expect or what to bring. Um, just don't forget to unmute yourself. I think you have the power to do that. Is that right, Benny? And we can stop recording, I suppose. Or not. What birding app do you recommend? Uh, good question. Um, there's so many. And they're all good. <laughs> okay. Um, but... There's one, that's, there's one that's free and it's called Merlin. So um, maybe start with that one because it's free to download Merlin, M-E-R-L-I-N and it's through the Cornell lab. Okay. Um, and then if you're willing to spend uh, 10 or $20 on an app, um, there's a number of other ones you can choose from. I, I, I think I have a lot, well, many of them. I've got iBird Pro, but um, the one I like or use the most is the Sibley. Uh, the Sibley Field Guide to Birds of North America. Um, I do have the National Geographic Field Guide to Birds of North America, and that used to be my favorite app until it stopped working. I don't think it's compatible with my phone or it needs an update or something, so I don't know what's going on, but that used to be my go-to app, and now I'm using the Sibley one mostly. But we can compare apps uh, this weekend too. Other people may have other suggestions. How about another question? Hey, Kurt, I, I noticed that there's less hummingbirds this season than in the past, at least at my house. Yeah. I, I put the feeders out. Have you noticed the same? Well, where do you live? In Yucca Valley. Okay. Um, have I noticed fewer hummingbirds? No, I haven't particularly noticed that, but every year is different. And so I don't know. Uh, that doesn't really help answer your question, but I, I don't know if there's a drop in hummingbird numbers that's discernible yet. Um, eBird.org, which I encourage all of you to use if you haven't discovered it already, eBird.org. Uh, you can sign up for a free account there and you can report your sightings. 
And you can also check on the status of things like your favorite hummingbird species and kind of see how they're doing and do year to year comparisons too for different locations. So once you get really good at using eBird, um, you can find out all kinds of interesting information that could help answer your question there in Yucca Valley. Thank but, you. Um, but it depends on how many flowers are flowering um, outside of our feeders. Um, you'd think in a dry year like this, the hummingbirds would be more dependent than ever on our <laughs> hummingbird feeders. Maybe we'd see more of them, right? But um, that's not the case at your house, at least. Yeah, I just something I observe because every year I, uh, you know, I get twenty to thirty of them hanging out by the feeders, and this year I've counted four so far that are hanging around. Yeah. Yeah, maybe the timing's off, or they're in more of a hurry, or they're finding other sources of food. Hey, thank you. Other questions? How about any uh, any uh, birds you're hoping to see this weekend, or? Any requests? <laughs> I have a question. The bird that cannot perch, how does it rest? Oh, the, the swift? Um, yes. Yeah. So they don't rest. I mean, they don't rest. They fly all day long. Um, they can, I guess, take little cat naps on the wing. Put it in auto drive, um, but they don't rest until the end of the day, and then they finally fly up to some high cliff ledge. And they do have feet, um, but they're just big enough to kind of cling on to the sides of the cliff and then scuttle into their little hole. But they're not big enough to perch. Well, thank you. So they eat on the wing. They mate on the wing. They probably even uh, take little naps on the wing. Oh my. Yeah. Life of a Swift. Other uh, I, yeah, I, I plan on um, working on Friday and I'm wondering if there's like a time which would be considered too late to arrive at the Institute. Like, could I get there at 830? Would that be okay? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's never too late. Um, I mean, the place doesn't close. Um, but it's, you know, it's nice when you can get there before dark, just so you can see mm -hmm. what you're doing, but, um, but it stays light pretty late these days. Um, but anyway, if you get there late, um, you know, some of us will, I'm sure will still be up and sort of watching for headlights. It's only us there. So, um, if we see a car coming down the road, we'll, we'll know it's whoever hasn't checked in yet. And then if you make your way to the office, I mean, if you get in really late, and people are asleep or something. If you go to the office, there's um, a way to um, contact Jason. There's a little kind of a phone thing there. Oh, okay, great. And so um, you'll be able to get him up and figure out what room you're in and all that. Yeah. Are, we, are there any shared rooms or are we mostly like have our own rooms or what's the um, sleeping situation like? Yeah, again, we're the only ones there this weekend, and we're one of actually the few groups to um, to stay at the Desert Study Center since COVID. So um, things have kind of changed there, um, but so I don't know what Jason has in store for us in terms of who's in what room, um, but it's not very crowded there, so there's a, a better chance we'll be able to spread out. Yes. Okay. Um, Kevin is also putting a uh, phone number up. Is that your number or that, is that Benny's number? Yeah, Kurt, it's my cell phone number. Um, just want to let everybody know that if they're gonna be arriving after 10 p.m., I can provide the site manager's information. Um, that way, once you arrive after hours, like he will at least be aware that you guys will get there late. Yeah, so if, if you think you're gonna be late too, then you know, give us a heads up now or let Benny know now. So we, we can kind of watch for you um, and not worry. Um, and then copy down the phone number that Benny just, is it in the chat? That 951 number is actually Benny's number, even though it says Kevin Wong, she's using his um, 
account tonight. And so have, um, have Benny's cell phone number written down somewhere in case you need it. Um, there's pretty good cell phone reception at Zizek's and Wi-Fi too. Um, um, if you guys want, you can, you can give him my phone number too, just in case, since I'm going to be the volunteer there or m myself and Jesse. Yeah, if you want to put it in the chat, Angela, okay. go ahead. Um, uh, yes, um, and bring a flashlight. Um, so yeah, I'm guessing uh, Jason's gonna spread us out in different rooms, I would imagine, unless you're a couple or something. Um, and then there's a short walk to the, um, the bathrooms. So there's not private bathrooms in each room. Uh, you do have to walk a short distance to the bathrooms and the shower. So bring a flashlight for that. Um, and we might see some other interesting things this weekend too. I mentioned the bighorn sheep. So every time you drive up and down Zizek's road, watch for those sheep and you're gonna see them. Um, and it also could be good for reptiles this weekend. We may see a snake or two or some interesting lizards. That means I'm gonna be a little bit later because I'm gonna pull over and take pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I, you know, I'm, I'm coming from Palm Desert. So mm -hmm. I like to leave, I like to take my time getting up there and travel through the Mojave National Preserve. So, you know, it depends on which direction you're coming from, but I'll be going through 29 Palms and past Amboy and then up to Kelso and then cutting over to Baker from there. It's a really nice scenic drive and there's a chance to see desert tortoise and other things along the road. Uh, so um, depending on what direction you're coming from, you know, plan your route accordingly. Um, if you can avoid the, the Interstate 15, that's great. But I know some of you might be coming from more the LA direction. You can't help but get on the 15. I'm in Redlands and um, I saw a hooded Oriole. I think it was maybe two Fridays ago. Um, I've seen them before in the past as well, but I'm wondering if they're here only like certain times of the year, like maybe in the winter. So and I never yeah. really made note of when I, like what time of the year I saw them, but it definitely wasn't summer. It was like around springtime, I think. Well, it's time for you to start reporting them to eBird, right? <laughs> and, you'll, and you'll have those dates, you know, saved forever. But um, the Orioles are, are migrants that summer here. So they usually start arriving in the first week of March, sometime in March. Okay. From Central America or Southern Mexico, where they spend the winter. And then they uh, are looking for palm trees. They're going to nest here. And then sometime around August or September, they're heading south. So they're here for the summer. Oh, very cool. Um, yeah, I see that um, Benny is suggesting you fuel up before uh, you get to Baker. The prices of gas in Baker will be shocking. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, if you can gas up in Barstow, if you're passing through Barstow, I would top off there. And if you're coming the other way like me, you know, you might want to top off with 29 Palms at least. Um, when we drive on Saturday, you know, we can carpool if you want. It always helps. I'll have a radio so we can talk car to car. And um, again, we'll be driving from Desert Study Center to Shoshone and back. And that's going to be about 120 miles round trip. Something along those lines. Maybe not that much, but yeah, 50 miles, 60 miles. Kurt, will you do a scorpion hunt like we did in the fall? Okay, yeah, the question is, will we do a scorpion hunt? Yeah, we've got some uh, time on Saturday uh, since we um, did two PowerPoints tonight. <laughs> we bought ourselves a little scorpion time. Um, so if it's not too windy, you've got to watch for that wind. Um, I'm always up for a scorpion hunt. So we'll just have to see how the weather is. Yep. Are you guys using black lights when you do that? 
Yes, and if you have your own, bring them, but we have a set as well that um, we can use for everybody. Um, yeah, anything else? So um, if there's nothing else, I'll wish everybody a good night and um, I'll, I'll send out some handouts, uh, you know, PDF files tomorrow that'll get forwarded to you. You do not have to print them out. So don't waste paper unnecessarily, but if you see uh, something that interests you, then look at it or print it out if you wish, it's up to you. But I'll send you a variety of um, handouts relating to birds, birding, et cetera. And uh, again, I'll see you Friday at the Desert Study Center. Again, I hope to get there uh, between five and six myself, no later than six. That's my goal. But if you want to get there a little bit earlier, you can. I'm probably going to be there between 7.30 and 8. Okay. Yeah, because I have to work too before I go. Yep. Great. It's a really neat place, so you're going to like it.